TheDailyMass.com. Experience the Roman Catholic Mass from historic St. Louis Cathedral every day on TheDailyMass.com. His love anywhere in the world. Good evening, I'm Sarah McDonald. And I'm Jason Angelette. Welcome to Issues in Faith. Well, November is obviously a month that um, many people focus on giving thanks. I actually saw something on Facebook and um, it says, November is the month though, that those that spend the rest of the 11 months complaining on Facebook <laughs> find 30 days to be grateful for everything. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But it's an important time to focus on. on no, we people. have to be uh, thankful. I, I always think of the story where Christ heals the 10 lepers, mm -hmm. right? And then, and then one of them came back and, uh, and, and the struggle that Christ had, where's the other nine, you know? Right. So, um, and we're, we're called to be a, a, a thankful people, like the, the Eucharist, the, the word itself, Eucharist, means thanksgiving. So, right. we're called to be a Eucharistic people. We're called to be um, thankful and to give that thanks to God. And not just in November, but Not always. just in November, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, we can highlight and say, That's yes, right. remember this and kind of beef There's it up a, lot a little bit more. a lot of secular mem uh, reminders to be thankful yes. for our blessings. Yeah. So, it's, it's, a good, it's a good month. It's a good time. And it's also, um, you know, for I'm sure in your house and in mine, my son has already, even at two and a half, has started pointing out Santa Claus in the commercials yes, and yes. everything else. So it's it's fun to start to get into that family yes. um, holiday time of oh, year. Oh, I'm so pumped um, more than ever, I think, uh, maybe this year. I'm not sure why. I guess it may be the new baby coming close mm -hmm. to Christmas. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, they ha people have to learn that there's a time when you put up your Christmas decorations and it can't be an ordinary time. There's somebody in um, my neighborhood that has their blow up Christmas decorations up already. No, I, it kind of, it, it kind of turned <laughs> my husband and I off. And I'm not, it, it's, it's wonderful that people want to sell Celebrate and be excited, but liturgically. L yeah, the liturgically. There's a there's a season, and we have to appreciate and be thankful mm -hmm. for each season when we're there, so that we can enjoy that season That's to the right. fullest when we're there. Well, November is also some other um, times to observe. We'll be talking um, with our adoption services program representatives later in the show. Uh, November's Adoption Awareness yes. Month, um, but it's also National Black Catholic History Month. Awesome. And um, a lot of people ask, you know, why do we highlight this time? And it's because because here in the United States, and particularly here in New Orleans, we have such a rich tradition mm -hmm. of um, the African American culture um, blending with in Catholicism mm -hmm. and, and their expression and their forms of worship and the tradition that has been here, you know, for almost 300 years, as long as the city has been here. We're getting mm -hmm. ready to celebrate the tricentennial of New Orleans in a couple of years, and yeah. those traditions started then. Yes. So. Um, we really want to focus not on, um, you know, segregating groups out, but celebrating mm -hmm. the important contributions um, of all races, of all ethnic backgrounds to Catholicism. We are a universal church. Amen. And how the faith has really formed and shaped the lives of so many people, and it has shaped culture, and it's helped to to. Uh, bridge gaps, helps right. to strengthen people and to help give people hope and struggles. And so, yeah, we have to um, recognize that for sure. That's right. And our Office of Black Catholic Ministries, our director, Ansel Augustine, who's, mm -hmm. who's really dynamic yeah, and he's really fantastic. incredible. We've had him on the show several yeah. times. Um, he's put together, well, they put together a monthly newsletter, but in this month's issue, um, highlighting Black Catholic History Month, they have a, some uh, special did you know facts? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to share some of those with our viewers. But um, there are about two million black Catholics in the United States of America. Catholics of African descent represent almost 25% of the one billion Roman Catholics throughout the world wow. in more than 59 countries. And we are all That's very fine. well aware that Africa is a place where the church is growing and, and almost in its infancy. A lot of vocations, many, people lot coming of vocations. from Africa to the United States to be priests That's here right. for us. That's Thank right. You. Um, there were three African popes, um, St. Victor, who was Pope from 186 to 197 AD, mm -hmm. um, St. Militatis from 311 to 314 AD, and I will butcher this name, but St. Gelasius, who is... Um, that sounded good to me. Thank you. Uh, was Pope from 492 to 496 AD. So this is obviously even longer than our 300 years yes. here in New Orleans. It goes back almost yeah. to the time of Christ. Um, there are 102 historically black colleges and 253 Catholic colleges in the United States, but the only both black and Catholic college 
is the University, University here in New Orleans. That's so amazing. it's definitely something to be proud, proud of. of. Um, it was also a university founded by a saint, St. Catherine yeah. Drexel. So um, it's such a blessing to have that here. Dr. Francis, who's led the school for so many years, doing really extraordinary things. Um, on January 6, 1966, Bishop Harold Perry was ordained Bishop of New Orleans, and he was the first black bishop stationed in the United States since the 1900s. Uh, Blessed Henriette de Lille, founder of the yes. Sisters of the Holy Family, who are very active still here mm -hmm. in the Archdiocese, um, is on her way to becoming the first African American saint. And the Knights of St. Peter Claver, who are headquartered here in New Orleans, mm -hmm. were founded in 1909 by the Josephite Fathers. And so that's just a few um, special yes. things for people to keep in mind about that tradition of, of black Catholic history mm -hmm. and tradition that's here in New Orleans. Thanks be to God. And we'll be right back. We're local and educational. WLAE, New Orleans Public Television. We never forget our best teachers. The ones who do so much more than teach. They inspire and insist we bring our best in everything we do. We find those mentors in our Catholic schools. It's why Catholic school graduates consistently go on to college, land better jobs, embrace faith, and lead. Louisiana Catholic Schools, in a class of their own. You're watching WLAE, New Orleans Public Television. Find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. November is Adoption Awareness Month, and joining us tonight to talk about the local Catholic Church's effort to promote adoption is Dana Cousins of the Catholic Charities Adoption Services. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. So tell us about the services itself. When was it started? Catholic Charities has been working with adoption, maternity services since the early 1900s. Oh, wow. Praise God. So how did you get involved with it? I've been involved with adoption services since probably the early 1990s. Awesome. Um, started with an internship at Catholic Charities in their crisis pregnancy program access uh -huh, right. and from there began working with adoption services. So starting the, uh, the 1900s, early 1900s, mm -hmm. and now fast forward to where we are right now, how has it grown and what services do you all provide? Yeah, it's changed drastically. Um, things were very, very secretive, mm -hmm. very closed. Um, society's acceptance of pregnancy was very different mm -hmm. um, for adoption. The closeness that was there, things are much more open now. Sure. Individuals are able to talk about adoption. Families are talking about adoption. We're seeing children tell their adoption stories. It's mm -hmm. amazing to stand with sometimes a three or four year old and they're talking about their adoption story. Right. Well, you have so basically the services providing people who are looking for a child to adopt and people who have a child that they're that they are having a, some something is happening that they need to ask someone to take responsibility. So could you tear? Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little about those two situations? Yeah, it could be those. Situations situations or it could be um, a woman who's pregnant mm -hmm. and is exploring her options. She may be in a situation that she would like to parent her child but for one reason or another she's, she may not be able to mm -hmm. or she needs to explore options if parenting isn't going to be a possibility for at the time that she delivers. It may be that at the time that she delivers she's not able to parent. Right. So for families that are looking to adopt, they contact the agency, they request a questionnaire, we talk with them about whether they're interested in domestic adoption or international adoption. We do have some families that they're not necessarily looking to adopt locally. Mm -hmm. They may not necessarily be looking to adopt an infant. They may be open to an older child, sure. perhaps a child with special needs also. Awesome. Well, um, what, what are the like normal ages that you'll see around in our area that for, for adoption? For children, mm -hmm. infants, yeah. newborns. Mostly, mm -hmm. and so what happens in a situation where someone is looking uh, for an, a, to, to adopt a child? What kind of um, information do they need to, to have in hand when they go find uh, this mm -hmm. information? For a family that's contacting us, we ask that they be between the ages of 27 and 45, mm -hmm. and that they be married a minimum of, of three years when they're applying to the program. And then we meet with them on a case-by-case -case basis and explore where they are in their journey to adoption. Some families are, are in the beginning stages, and they're they're beginning to explore is adoption right for their family? Is Catholic Charities adoption program right for their family?
family, is open adoption right for their family? There's so many questions that, that they're looking at, and it truly is a journey. Well, what's the difference between open adoption and that I heard that there's a closed adoption? Mm -hmm. What's the distinction between the two? Um, for most families, it's the level of contact with the birth family. Mm -hmm. um, the birth family is typically asking for pictures, letters, they may be asking for contact after the baby's been born. Um, there's various levels of that, and it, it's something that works for both the adoptive family and for the birth family, but it's always what's in the best interest of the child. The and child. what's really interesting is the children really understand it. it yeah. It's another person that loves them in their life. Yeah. It's not about co-parenting. Right. It's, um, it's a really positive, positive relationship in where there's a lot of love for a child and everyone's there to help this child have their, their questions answered and, and to just grow up in an amazing, amazing relationship. If a couple is looking to adopt, what are some things, uh, guidelines, or some things that you would want to tell them uh, as they try to go on this journey? Because I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if they're thinking that, well, want to do is today and walk out the door mm -hmm. with the baby that day. Is that is that how it happens? Yes, we absolutely get those calls. Yeah. Hey, I'm ready to adopt. Can right I now. come and pick up a baby today? <laughs> we wish it was that easy. Yeah. Um, certainly one of the, the biggest changes with adoption is that there are fewer and fewer babies available for adoption. But one of our goals is that we don't have families waiting years upon years for adoption. Mm -hmm. So we try to open up our list once a year, and it's typically in November and December, so the list is open at this time, and have families call and request a questionnaire so that we can meet with them individually, talk about their goals for adoption, see where they are on their journey, and to decide if now is the time for them to begin the home study process and to begin their journey for adoption. and see where things go from there and understand that it, it may take a year, it may take a year and a half. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. For some families it happens much, much sooner. We have yeah. some families that they apply, their home studies complete it, they have an adoption profile and it's a couple months. Oh wow. And as much as they thought, we're ready today, yeah. and then when we make that call, wait, already? <laughs> it happened already? How did this happen I so know fast? When my wife was pregnant uh, with our first, and it was, I think, at the end of the, the pregnancy, and she's ready, like, we got to go to the hospital. I'm, I'm ready to deliver. I'm like, hold on, I just got used to you being pregnant. Like, I'm yes. not ready for this just yet. Yes. Um, so what about people um, who, are, who are wondering um, to give up their child for adoption? How does that whole process mm -hmm. work? For individuals that are pregnant and thinking about placing their child for adoption, they're also doing a lot of work. Um, Cindy Falgu our maternity case manager, and she's providing case management to individuals on a case-by-case -case basis. They may have um, medical needs that need to be addressed. They may, she may be working with them on their budget. Whatever their needs are, she's working with them while at the same time exploring parenting because parenting needs to be explored at the same time that they may be exploring adoption. That's a great, a great point. I, you know, I didn't think about that. When you, you get somebody who's in that situation to make sure mm -hmm. they're, they're gonna make the right decision as far as to give the child up for adoption, maybe they can make this, this situation work for them mm -hmm. and giving them those options to do that. That's fantastic. What are some great stories, though, that you've seen over the years of, of people coming in wanting to adopt and seeing um, adoption happen in their family? Yeah, I, I think just a general story is that what we tell families is the waiting's hard. Yeah. You know, for every family that we work with, they want to be parents mm -hmm. and th they want it now and, sure. and we want it now for them too. It's sure. very hard to, to sit with a family and their dream of being a parent isn't happening at the time that they really want it to and, and every one of them has been through a lot. Yeah. Do you get to stay in touch with the people, the families that we do. Up and they come by and show you? Yeah, sometimes progress. I'm not sure they realize that we become part of their family. Is that right? Sometimes <laughs> we're still involved with families 50 years after their adoptions wow. have taken place and we didn't mm -hmm. know them originally, but we are. But, but in general, for the families, you know, they apply to the agency and we tell them the wait is going to be hard. Yeah. And every day they're waiting and, and wondering when it's going to happen. And, and, and what we really believe in, and part of it's the faith in the program and mm -hmm. the faith in adoption, is that when their child joins their family, it's the child that's meant to be with their family. Yeah. But it's hard to understand that while weeks and oh, months yeah. are going by and you're seeing other families receive placements and your family's still waiting. Still waiting. But it, it truly is, and, and to watch a family stand, and we, we do placements in our family in our family room, and to watch a family receive their child, whether they're receiving it from the birth mom, mm -hmm. or they're re receiving it from a staff member, or perhaps one of our receiving homes that's been caring for the child, to see that family, that connection that happens, and for them at some point to perhaps turn to us and say, 
this is the child that was meant for me. It was really hard to believe it all the all that time we waited, but yes, this is this is why we waited and all that time is gone. What about the the children who are adopted? I'm sure the parents must there must be this fear of like my child, like my baby. I, w I want the best for my baby. Um, does that child who's being adopted like do you get to see the the growth in that child, the love that they get to experience for the birth parents, mm -hmm. no, for the, and for the, the birth parents, but for y'all to see this, for, to see this mm -hmm. with the children. We do. We follow um, the families for six months to a year post placement. But for the families, they love to send pictures too, and we mm -hmm. love to receive them. Yeah. One of the uh, things that we have in our office, we have a young lady who, as part of her Girl Scout Gold project, did a family tree on our wall, mm -hmm. and it has a picture of every family that we've done a placement with. Wow! And we have families that come back years and years later with their children, sometimes from out of state, and they take their children on their adoption journey. Mm -hmm. This is where I was when I got the call. Yeah. This is the hospital where you were born. This is the office where we came, and here's your picture on the wall. Yeah. This is where I met your birth mom for the first time. And so that becomes part of that child's adoption story too. So as he or she is growing, it becomes part of their story, just as any other child says, this is the hospital I was born in. What's this been like for you working with adoption services? It's incredible. Yeah. You know, sometimes people will say, well, how many adoptions have you worked with? I have no idea. Yeah. It's so many, yeah. um, but every story is so special and so unique, and, and I find it such a blessing to, to be able to be a part of these families, their lives and their children. and. And sometimes it's a very small part, and for others it, it, it's a larger part, but they're all equally important. So if someone's looking for information uh, mm -hmm. to adopt or to give an adoption, what, how, uh, how can they do that? Yeah, they can check our website mm -hmm. at www.adoptnola.com, mm -hmm. or they can contact our office, 504-885-1141, um, and we're happy to talk with anyone about adoption. Well, Dan, thank you so much for being with us. Thank God you bless so much. you and all that you're thank working. You. Thanks thank for you so out. much. Again, for more information about Catholic Char Charities Adoption Services, please go online to www.adoptnola.com or call 504-885-1141. And we'll be right back. We're local and entertaining. WLAE, New Orleans Public Television. The heart of Woman's New Life Center is its outreach to women in unplanned pregnancies, especially those who are seeking an abortion. Our professional counseling services, combined with free ultrasound tests, provide each woman with the nurturing she needs while also revealing her unborn child to her. For more information about the life-saving work of Woman's New Life Center, call 504-831-3117 or visit womansnewlife.com. For years, prisoners who were released after serving their time were given a bus ticket and a few dollars and sent on their way. Today, thankfully, there are a growing number of programs aimed at helping ex-cons in their new lives and reduce the chances of them returning to prison. One such program started right here in New Orleans is having tremendous success because organizers found that it's not just jobs that these ex-cons need, it's to be needed. Karen Boudry reports. The odds are stacked against them. They are ex-cons. Between them, they've spent over 200 years behind bars. They've not only found Jesus, but a program that seems to beat the odds, turning despair into hope. I started with the nightlife and robbing and the drugs and robbing drug dealers and then shifted to K&B drugstores. Right now I'm praying that God lets me end life on a positive cycle and not do the harm and the things that I've done in the past. Leonard Bastida spent 40 years and six months in prison. Despite all that time, there's a program that still believes in him and others like him. It's called the AmeriCorps Cornerstone Builders Program. This program is not about charity. It's about work. It's about making a contribution. And 
some people are happy, those coming out of prison, that people actually believe that they can do something. Ronnie Moore helped start the program with Catholic Charities and AmeriCorps. Since 2007, he says 150 ex-offenders have come through the program and only five have been arrested again. That speaks volumes. In light of state statistics that show nearly 50% of most ex-cons returning to prison within five years. But these 15 men and women have come to the Ozanam Inn to be sworn in to the AmeriCorps Cornerstone Builders in hopes that their paths will be different. My life was a total mess. Uh, not proud of the things that I did, but I am glad that I'm here to see another day. You know, God has placed a lot of people in my life over the years, and I've turned it around, you know. And right now, what I really want to do is be positive and help those guys that's coming behind me not to make the mistakes that I made. The program offers similar benefits to the original AmeriCorps program for college students. After a year of immersing themselves in community service, the inductees will earn scholarship money to pursue an education, and that's empowerment. I done been through and out the system, but today, and his words say, do not look back, son, and I don't. I'm changing. And I thank God for the people that he's put in my presence. Some of the inductees will live and work here at the Ozanam Inn homeless shelter. Others will do their service in various other organizations. But all will have an equal chance at redemption. Most of my life I was thinking about myself. Thinking about myself made me use drugs. Thinking about myself made me get caught by the police for using drugs. So a uh, smart man told me just yesterday, you know, it ain't about you all the time. You know, do something for somebody else. So it's interesting to see where America is going to take me because I'm, you know, start doing something for somebody else instead of myself. Thank you. And that is the simple key to the program's success, says Ronnie Moore. I think service is redemptive. It is an opportunity for people to give rather than to take. And I think that has an enormous impact on the lives of people. And with their oath, Faced with adversity, I will persevere. Faced with adversity, I will persevere. These men plan to do some good for others, and in doing so, turn their own lives around. For Issues in Faith, I'm Karen Boudry. You're watching WLAE, New Orleans Public Television. Find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Welcome back. If you have a question for us or an idea that you'd like to see on air, please write to us at Issues in Faith, 3330 North Causeway Boulevard, Suite 345, Metairie, Louisiana 7002, or you can email us at questions at WLAE.com. Plus, if you missed an episode, you can catch up online at www.archdiocese-no.org. And before we go, we want to thank the students from St. Paul's School for being with us tonight as they come every year. Mm -hmm. So thanks so much to St. Paul's for being here. And that's our program for this evening. For all of us at Issues in Faith, thanks for watching. We'll be back next week. Hope you join us again soon. Until then, God bless.